Hello, a very good morning. Welcome along to Ireland AM on Virgin Media One. That's us. It's Tuesday, January 17th. You're stuck on the kettle. It's freezing. We've got a fun packed show between now and 10. It really is. So, so cold. cold. So <laughs> cold. Kettle on. Did you have the paper on the windscreen? No, I forgot. Uh, forgot. Didn't. Forgot. Forgot. I was out with water. Buckets oh, of water. Uh, uh, coming up, influencer and entrepreneur Suzanne Jackson is hoping to lift this year's glitter ball and dancing with the stars. We're going to be getting the inside scoop and all the goss that's coming up at 8 o'clock. Yeah, in more TV news, this year's Winter Love Island contestants are set to bring heat to the villa. Just what you want to see in January. Sexy people wearing no clothes. They include a farmer, an actress and a biomedical science student. We'll be reviewing all the action from last night's episode. Makes them want to go on holiday, so it doesn't have mm -hmm. uh, Alan, your thoughts on last night's episode? Oh, do you know what? The first one is always a bit boring. You're being introduced <laughs> to them and it's it's like, yeah. It is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah. But we will get into it. I think it will pick up along the weeks. Eight weeks of it. Is it? Oh, look, I have to say, the last series though, was very good. So you, they kind of seem to have got the gist of themselves yeah, again. No? But eight weeks. Do you want to give over eight weeks of your life to Love Island? Some yep. people will. But it's, they do it in the summer when, you know, you can go outside. Sure, we can't go outside. Yeah. So why not? We're That's struck. We're yeah. also struck. Grand. Now, also on the show this morning, our very own Love Island star, Jack O'Keefe, is serving up a healthy fake away lamb kebab. And we'll be meeting some of the teams taking part in this year's basketball National Cup finals. And we'll be trying to do some hoops ourselves. Now, Derek is out and about this morning and he's in Dublin. Good morning, Derek. Yes, Al, we're slap bang here in the heart of Dublin City Centre this morning. It's a very cold start. In fact, we have that status yellow snow and ice warning remaining in place, or low temperature warning, in fact, remaining in place until 12 o'clock later on this afternoon with an ongoing risk of thunder and hail out there today. But guys, you'll notice the building right just uh, over my shoulder. That is the Lafayette building. Of course, we're off to visit the National Wax Museum later on this morning. So we're going to be bumping into Bono, having a jiggle with Jedward and some frolics with fun. Their test. Who knows what will happen? Ah. <laughs> it's already like, a happy I Tuesday. I didn't expect to be having a jiggle with Jedward this morning. Oh, well, listen, you never know. It's okay, I look like the couch, so that's nice. I just realised I look like the couch. Anyway, do you know what? It's time to say hello uh, for the first time this morning over in the Virgin Media News Hub to Ashling Roach. Thanks, Maureen. Good morning. Plans to avert a repeat of the recent overcrowding crisis will be discussed by the Dáil Health Committee and HSE officials this morning. Ahead of the meeting, a committee spokesperson says the group is looking at the HSE's plans being implemented to tackle the numbers waiting on trolleys. It's been a difficult start to the year in our hospitals. Record overcrowding figures of 931 reported from the start of January. Over 500 people waiting on trolleys for treatment, according to figures published yesterday. Today, the Joint Committee on Health will meet with representatives from the HSE, the first time since the recent overcrowding crisis. The committee chair, Sean Crow, saying this year's winter surge of respiratory illnesses combined with the shortage of acute hospital beds has led to hundreds of patients waiting on trolleys in our hospitals every day. He says the committee will ask the HSC to outline the measures being implemented to tackle the record numbers on trolleys and wants to hear what the HSC's medium to long term plans are for the predictable increased pressure in emergency departments next year and beyond. Marie Mulcahy, Virgin Media News. Free GP care for all would cost up to almost 900 million euro. Research published by the ESRI has found that extending free GP care to everyone in 2026 will cost the taxpayer between 381 million and 881 million euro in the first year. The research funded by the Department of Health examines the impact of rolling out the scheme to everyone in the country based on age and income. A status yellow low temperature and ice warning is in place across the country this morning. Manaren says there's a risk of icy stretches and hazardous driving conditions on untreated roads and paths. An Arctic airflow began to establish across the country overnight, with temperatures dropping to as low as minus two degrees. Dozens of people are still missing in the Ukrainian city of Dnipro. The number of dead rose to 40 yesterday. Emergency teams are still searching the rubble of the apartment block which was destroyed in the attack. Hopes of finding any more survivors are fading. Over 70 people are being treated in hospital for their injuries. In the US, six people have died following a shooting at a home in Central California. The victims include a six-month-old baby. Police responded to reports of multiple shots fired at a property north of Los Angeles. Police say two suspects are still at large.
Actually, the report was they believed an active shooter uh, was in the area because of the number of rounds that were being fired. Uh, deputies arrived about seven minutes later. As deputies arrived on scene, they noticed two victims, two victims who were apparently dead uh, in uh, the street. The deputies uh, began calling for uh, more assistance um, and located a third victim of a shooting in the doorway of the residence uh, where the gunfire was coming from. As deputies began searching the area, uh, unfortunately, they began finding multiple victims at this scene. In South Africa, a search is on for a tiger that has escaped from its enclosure. Residents have been warned to be on high alert in the region of South Johannesburg after the animal fled from a private farm at the weekend. The female tiger has already attacked a man who survived. She was kept in an enclosure together with her male uh, companion and uh, fences were cut by perpetrators obviously to gain access to the property to probably steal uh, and then she escaped through an open uh, a, a, a cut fence and then she made her way to where we currently are. For car insurance, van insurance or home insurance, call the quote devil. Unless of course you've got money to burn. Yes, sure. Call one indeed. We're live here from the heart of the capital. A very good morning because we're off to visit the Wax Museum a little bit later on this morning. So lots of fun coming your way over the next hour. So anyway, let's take an opening look at weather together. Now with Owen Kelly with us on cameras the 17th of January and it's a very cold morning out this morning. In fact, we have that status yellow, low temperature and ice warning remaining in place until 12 o'clock later on this afternoon. We're looking at freezing fog with a sharp to severe ground frost at the moment. So kettle on the car window kind of vibe out there this morning with showers hitting parts of Donegal. Uh, Sligo not escaping either there through uh, Charlestown. Uh, now right across the day those light northwesterly breezes in the driving seat bringing with it across the day some scattered showers. In fact where those showers do fall they could be wintry in nature with a risk of sleet and a possibility of snow as well tipping down to lower levels. Now in with all of that where those showers do fall we will see a risk of thunderstorm and hail activity out there as well. But so nice sun shine on the cars so a little bit of seesaw weather action out there the 17th of the month top values again on the chilly side at two to five degrees Finally then tonight, again, more wintry showers for a time. They will persist, especially into western and northern areas where they will be wintry in nature. Very similar to last night, once again, a sharp to severe ground frost. Black ice on roads as well, so do be mindful if you do have to make a journey tonight into tomorrow morning because it will be quite a cold, in fact, a bitterly cold night in store with values back to about minus four to minus one degrees. So that's how it's shaping up for now. Here in the capital, it's quite cold out this morning, so wrap up and we'll be back again live at 7.35. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a quote. On the way, Public Expenditure Minister Pascal Donoghue is on thin ice over money routes. Thin ice thin with the night. weather. Everyone's on thin ice at the did. moment out there. We have more on that story and everything else making the front pages after the break. It's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. Its headline is about Pascal Donoghue, unsurprisingly. Donoghue insists he did not breach electoral spending limits. Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform Pascal Donoghue has insisted he breached no spending limits by accepting an offer from a friend to erect posters for him in his constituency during the 2016 election campaign. Fianna Fáil backs in battle Donoghue and Rao over election expenses. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. Fianna Fáil will back Pascal Donoghue over his failure to declare election donations as long as there are no further revelations about the public expen expenditure minister. The examiner leads with homes at risk as landlords quit. The exodus of landlords from the rental sector due to selling up is putting households at immediate risk of homelessness, housing charity Threshold has warned. The mayor goes with pray for Christy. Aslan singer Christy Dingham is receiving palliative care at his home. His devastated family revealed yesterday. The crazy world hit maker was admitted to hospital last year with complications from a long-running blood disorder. 
The Sun leads with that same story. There are no words. We're devastated. Christy Dignam's bandmates have told of their devastation at hearing he is receiving palliative care. The Herald's front page. Monster jailed for a 19-hour horror ordeal. A man who broke into his ex-partner's home and terrorised her in an ordeal that lasted almost 19 hours has been jailed for seven years. The Star's front page. Jailed for online affair hitman plot. A man who tried to hire a hitman to kill a couple that were exchanging intimate online messages with his now ex-wife has been jailed for four and a half years by the Central Criminal Court. And finally, tourist tax just to stay in Dublin is the top story on the Daily Mail. Rural TDs and the hotel industry are gearing up to fight a plan to bring in a new Dublin room hotel room tax. A report released yesterday shows a tax and an overnight accommodation could raise more than 12 million euro a year for the cash-strapped capital. It's news to me, the cash-strapped capital. Yeah, um, this is from Dublin City Council who yeah. have approved this. And so if you want to spend a night in Dublin, you're not coming up for the night from Limerick, you've got to pay tax. An extra 1% on it. Anyway, joining us uh, to take a look at other stories on the newspapers this morning is Anton Savage from News Talk. Good morning to you, Anton. Morning. Um, this isn't expensive enough to stay in Dublin. Dublin's gonna... wonderful. It makes total sense. Can we stay with you? Yeah, when no we're staying off. as long as you can. Anton up. has plenty. Oh, you're going to put a tax <laughs> oh, on course, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Fantastic. If you're the, hotel, the hotel rooms are extortionate as it is without putting the prices up even more and more tax. But anyway, listen, let's move on to um, Pascal Donoghue. <sighs> is this a storm in a tea? Like, is this making a mountain of a molehill or is this something actually... Well, this is one of those where if you give the actual answer, you can almost hear social media launch at you. Okay, but the truth is, yes, careful. it's a nothing burger and it'll go nowhere. But let us put that to one side and, and <laughs> analyse it like it isn't the only story. Can we write that down? Well. It's a nothing burger and it's going to go <laughs> nowhere. Yesterday you Sorry. laughed your leg off. I mean, the things happening on Making the News. I should caveat that with one thing. A friend of mine many years ago, he's a, a, he was an ex-cop in the States and his son got arrested on something very minor. And he was incandescent with rage. I remember asking him about it and saying, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world. And he said, no, now he's in the system. Now, every time he gets pulled over, he's in the system and it cascades. That's Pascal Dunham, whose real problem now is he's in the system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So everybody will be pouring over everything he's ever done. Every political correspondent will be living in his underpants. And unless he is absolutely squeaky clean on everything else, the next three weeks is going to be interesting. If he is squeaky clean, then he's all right and he's out the gap. And they won't have to pay tax on yes. living in his underpants. Correct, well. so there will be no underpants tax. So the issue but that what we actually have here is Pascal Donoghue, got uh, a gentleman decided to help out Pascal by yeah. getting posters put up in the 2016 election because yeah. Pascal was under a bit of pressure to get his seat. Turns out that the gentleman who got the posters put up paid for a van and six people to do the postering. This came to a total cost of €1,200, Euro, which is more than you are allowed to get from any one individual as a political donation. Mm -hmm. Hang on a minute, says oh, Pascal. Yes. Ah, hang, yeah. on. hang on a minute, He lads. loves his sums. He does his sums and he says, the van was separate to the other stuff. So, the <laughs> so that's a corporate that's donation. A corporate donation. You're allowed to get up to €200. Correct. Euro. Which now drops us below the 1,000 to about 917. 17. Right? So that 917 brings you under the threshold that it's okay for a single individual to get. So Pascal should be okay. But... But... Oh, <laughs> but <laughs> If you do get more than 600, so less than 1,000, more than 600, then you have to declare that to the Standards and Public Office Commission and say, look, there's the 917 that I got mm -hmm. from that guy. Pascal didn't do that. So it's not that, according to Pascal, it's not that he got money that he shouldn't have got. It's that he got money that he should have got, but he should have declared, declared. it, and he didn't. OK, so obviously, if you're in public office, yes, you should be held to a higher standard. Right. It's as simple as that. You're in the government. You have to do this. Speaking to people who have run... Uh, for the doll and say it's kind of homegrown campaigns. They're like, after the campaign, you have to go through absolutely everything. Obviously, if you run your campaign, you're trying to get your money back. And they're like, they never stop at you to account for everything. Pascal had a has a team of people. So someone should have, when he was found out about the van, this is in 2017, he still didn't declare it. Now, as soon as he found out about the other donation, about those people not being volunteers, he was told by the journalist, he did declare that. He was like, by the way, I didn't know that these weren't volunteers. Now, so... <laughs> well, if we look at the, the positive and the negative from Pascal's perspective, I suspect the, the most positive thing that he can cling to is that reputationally there is a sense that this is unusual for Pascal because yeah. he tends to be very dot the I's and cross the mm. T's and that will stand to him. And again, if there isn't another revelation, that's what all the reports are saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Fianna Fáil backbench TDs are saying, if this is it, we can live with it. If there's a number two, he's toast. 
The downside for Pascal is, if he was Minister for Culture, do you know, what he was thinking about a lot was poetry, you know, and paintings and the like, you could say, I'm not great at the old numbers. <laughs> yeah. But when you're the Minister for Finance yeah, yeah. and you're Chair of the Eurogroup Finance Ministers, yeah. you're kind of expected... Squeaky bum time to, for him. Uh, if yeah, they're I going through he's everything. Well, in this, in yeah. this country, our Minister of Finance used to have bank accounts. So, you know, it's all a bit... We've he got, we've got a weird at the time, egg. it was a difficult personal <laughs> domestic resting it. Let, what about Michael Stone, though, who has been the man who's done this? So then subsequently he's been found to be uh, recommended mm. by Pascal to go on to a few inner city Dublin it's, boards. Yeah, the inner city Dublin boards and the Land Development Agency. And again, this is one of the ones where there are, there are pros and cons politically, depending on how you look at it. The fact that he got appointed ministerially by... Um, Owen, what's his feature? His name, his name uh, now? Murphy. Who was the yeah, Pascal? Yeah. Who was, who was a, a cabinet colleague of Pascal yeah. Donoghue's. You would say, well, we wonder, does this raise questions about the manner of this and is there a connection between the two? On the other side of that, there was a stipend that he was allowed to take and expenses that he was allowed to take in that role, which he didn't take. He did the job for free. Absolutely. So you could say, well, he isn't financially feathering his nest by virtue of this um, uh, appointment. The only question then is, well, what influence over anything does the appointment give him? But again, th it is yet to add up to a smoking yeah. gun. But it, after, I suppose, Damien English last week, and then, of course, everything during the summer about that just kept on rumbling on Correct. about what's his... You know what I'm talking about. It just doesn't look good. 0896 111 to let us... Robert Troy. Uh, no, it's Robert Troy. Yeah, Thank you. There course. we go. Um, so um, it just doesn't look good and he is the Minister for Expenditure. Um, but Fianna Fáil are supporting him. Um, now we're going to move on to something... Uh, so I just say, part of the reason Fianna Fáil may be supporting him is I remember talking to a senior politician... He's a Fianna Gael politician, of course. Yeah, one of the things that I think a lot of politicians are wary of is grabbing the high moral ground. Because mm. if you decide I'm going to roast him on his declarations to Sippo, what you're doing is putting up a huge red flag that says, "Please dig through everything I have no ever submitted." Safe. Ever. No one is Everybody safe at the moment. Tends to tiptoe away from these. Yeah, and, and, and it does look like the ditch will be going through. Oh, the ditch like will the ditch go through town. Who have time. found out about Robert Troy? Who did everything? And the ditch have done English, remarkable going to, work yeah, both on absolutely. this, but also on a lot of the issues pertaining to on board Planola. The, the, the ditch yeah. was yeah. the website yeah. that led all of that, and they have a hell of a track record in digging up what is there. They really do, and they've done uh, an awful lot of work over the last couple of years there. And we're just going to move on to this other story. This has been rumbling on for a while, and this is. Landlord exodus contributing to the rise in homelessness. Yeah, homeless figures now at 11,000 plus, I think 11,800 are still yeah. bouncing off a record peak. And what we discovered recently was that in the last quarter of 2022, nearly half of the properties that were removed from the rental market, or rather, nearly half of the, yeah, nearly half of the properties that were removed from the rental market going up for sale were put up by landlords who wanted out of being landlords. Mm -hmm. The mom and pop landlord, the person who had the one or two buy to lets or who had kept the apartment that they bought in the boom and they yeah. now have their house, they have all decided enough of this, I am out. It's having a direct impact on um, homelessness and according to Threshold, which is the um, housing support people, they've done their um, survey mm. and what their survey is revealing is a lot of people who are now in danger of homelessness because they were in those houses and they're now being told. Yeah. Because uh, when you sell a house, say the, these landlords who were charged an exorbitant uh, tax, by the way, in relation to corporate landlords of barely any tax, you can't, you don't know that they're selling that house to a person who is going to live in that home. It could be sold for rental to a corporate landlord. So that's an issue as well. So that's that, more that's than likely. Is, yeah. More than likely, that is that is what is happening here at the moment. And also, there is there was a woman on the Tonight Show last year, and she was she had her own apartment, but she couldn't get into the apartment because some form or whatever, and she couldn't get the. Well, no, out. she went so to she Australia. Was, she li no, this moved is a woman who lived in Dubai, and, and she came back, and she's now homeless, even though she's like, I've, I do own a place, and I want to move in there, but she can't. It does feel like for the smaller landlords that we counted on for decades that this is detrimental to oh, yeah, the well, country I, I, now. I spoke on the, on the weekend on my own show to the um, uh, representative from Property Owners Association and what they were um, saying was, first of all, the yields at this point, when you factor in all the costs, the tax, you, yeah. you, might, you would be much better off just putting it in an index fund linked to uh, the stock market. When you then look at things like the eviction bans, people are saying, well, you know, it's all well and good and altruistic, but I don't want to be in a position where I'm locked into renting a property that I no longer want to rent. When you look at the bureaucracy in relation to what you have to do with the RTB, a whole load of landlords are saying, this is not worth the candle. Now, what's interesting according to the threshold survey is the manner in which a lot of them are exiting the market is pretty much the only ripcord there is to get out of being a landlord, which is, 
I'm moving into the house myself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently, 1,800 people have been told that, and what Threshold have discovered is that in a lot of cases, that ain't That's true. Um, which is very useful if you're the tenant, because if you can prove, no, 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 yeah. there is no family member of this landlord coming in here, you're able to stay yeah. in your house. But the government is now, it seems late in the day, discovering exactly what you say. Things like the tax regime, where if you're a company, you pay, what, 15% corporation tax on your profits. <laughs> so if small. I'm an individual, I pay 52% yeah. income tax on the same activity. They're starting to say, look, we have to do something. Have to do something. Have yeah. to do something. Yeah. Absolutely have to do something. Yeah, if you were we once a landlord, on. yeah. we'd love to hear from you why you exited the market. Well, we, do. we get a lot of texts one. even on this. And how difficult it is to yep. be a private landlord. Let's fi- just finish up with the, the sad news. Christy Dignam, obviously his family have said that he is in palliative care. Um, it's just sad news, I really, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah, because Aslan was lining up to do the... I mean, it's, it seems uh, amazing. It's one of those where you sort of look back and go, wow, time goes fast. The 40th anniversary of Aslan gigs were coming up in March. They were in the uh, Three Arena. That was all planned. And of course, all those gigs have now been pulled. And what a lot of the analysis is saying is it's highly unlikely that the guys are ever going to perform again. So a lot of people, I think, would be very saddened by this. To some extent, there is, you have to look at, it's a difficult silver lining to grasp. But Christy Dickens got a very difficult diagnosis a very long time ago yeah. mm-hmm. and has done a remarkable job in staying oh, healthy and well yeah, for a long period of time. But I think a lot of people would be sad to hear this Absolutely, news. and our thoughts are, of course, with Christy um, and his family. We hope that he's doing okay. He's been so good to us here in Virgin Media, coming in a lot uh, to chat to us, so our thoughts are with you at the moment. Anton Savage from News Talk, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We'll be back with you in Ireland AM Cheers, very Anton. shortly. Now, recent reports have shown that antisocial behaviour on public transport is on the rise right across the country. Joining us to discuss is Assistant General Secretary of the National Bus and Rail Union, Tom O'Connor, and President of the Garda Representative Association, Brendan O'Connor. Cousins, do we, are we, do we have the six degrees of separation here? <laughs> is that what's going on? No, no, I'm good, actually. <laughs> we haven't gotten that deep yet. Now, there was a report in the Examiner, Tom, the other day, and it just said, and this is this is a quote, they're like animals, I could see a driver being killed. And this is about Russian bus and rail drivers feeling unsafe at work. I could see a driver being killed. That is a very strong statement. That's the reality. Um, we, fortunately, we don't want to be in a show like this, uh, lamenting one of our our colleagues if something tragic happens. And that's why we're calling for intervention. The MBRU have been for a number of years now looking for a dedicated and fully funded, and that's important, fully funded, uh, Garda Transport Unit. And the the funding of it is important. We we had uh, Senator Finnegan's on there last night uh, looking for the fully funded Garda Transport Unit. Uh, There's a report in the paper today about the same thing for Lewis. Yeah. Yeah. But they have to, the National Transport Authority, the Minister for Transport, they've got to realise that provision of public transport in some of these hotspots, and they're known hotspots. You know, there's a couple of them in Dublin, uh, Navan, Cork, Limerick, uh, northern side of the Dart, the, some of the uh, interurban uh, rail lines. They know where the trouble is, and need, resources need to be funded and put in place. Uh, otherwise, the, the provision of public transport, as is happening in West Hall at the moment, uh, won't operate as it's planned. And Tom, can I ask you, what kind of instance are we talking about and has it increased in the severity over the years? Well, uh, just to put that in context, in, in West Halla alone last year, there was 137 instances. In December, there was 35. So there's a huge spike. Like what? Like What's what? What are they doing? Um, throwing rocks and missiles uh, at the buses, breaking windows, uh, letting off fireworks, uh, robbery, uh, drug abuse, uh, drink abuse, threatening the driver. Uh, there was Deborah, one of the, the, the female drivers, uh, a mob of 30 surrounded the bus. And she said she has nightmares. The most violent one was in his 20s and he was uh, banging on the security screen, trying to get into her and making all sorts of threats. We had the same, a mob surrounded the bus in, in Limerick, another young lady, you know, left on her own. Uh, the passengers being robbed and assaulted. And we've had quite a number of serious assaults of, of well, certain drivers, unfortunately, they don't have the protection of security screens. And can, can I ask you then, is there security devices installed on the buses and the trains for the drivers there that if something like that happens, they can press a button or something? Or do they have to get their mobile phone out and call somebody? Well, th- there's, there's panic alarms on the, the Dublin bus vehicles. Right. right. There's a text alert system on, uh, on the rail. But unfortunately, that's all after the fact. It doesn't prevent it. What we're calling for is a, a highly visible 
guard presence uh, on these hotspots to deter something happening, not uh, have uh, our colleagues in the Garda Shia Khanna come along after the fact. Well, Brendan, what do you say to that? Well, the, the, the incidents that Tom outlines there are very serious and they're breaches of the criminal, the criminal law and definitely our members would have to, have, have to respond and provide an appropriate response. But what we're saying is, our members, unfortunately, we're feeling um, the, 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 the impact of lower recruitment, uh, a lot of people leaving the Garda Shikana. So it's actually a resourcing issue. And as Tom says, it's very important to say, we absolutely, the members I represent, want to would love to commit and give Tom and his colleagues the confidence they would get from a highly visible police presence. But yeah. unfortunately, the situation in Garda Shikana is that resources are... Um, the funding is there, but the personnel resources are simply not there and they're not materialising. So I think we would struggle to, f to deliver that service, unfortunately, with the current numbers and the current problems that we're experiencing. But mm. again, it's, it's, it, as the, 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 the situations that Tom described, our members are receiving of similar levels of violence and attack. And so we yeah. just, we're struggling to cope with our own. Um, but when you see those scenes around certain areas in Dublin and around the country when there's teenagers ramming police cars and stuff like that, when I was young, I'd be terrified if a guard came into the house or came up the drive or whatever like that. Do you think that whole attitude towards the guard is gone, like the fear or the respect is gone from most of these younger people? Well, I think just the statistics and the anecdotal evidence would suggest, and from what Tom has described there, is that there is a level of violence and a level of disrespect for whether it's authority or whether it's people in certain positions, but certainly, yes, there is a level of violence and, and, and disrespect and, and a willingness to attack yeah. that is, is something that I, certainly we don't have the explanation for, but we're on the receiving end of. OK, so I suppose you do have to say you don't... We'd love to hear from people, you know, whether... What you feel about in your community, if assaults are on the rise, if you've seen something on public transport, 0896 111 Because we can't say it. Like, obviously, it does feel... I know we've got rolling news 24-7... But it feels like society. there's a menace in society in certain areas that you don't want to walk into, that you're like, I don't feel safe there, that I would have walked into like 10 years ago, no hassle. So is this down to an inept criminal justice system that it doesn't matter if you rack up all of these convictions? Because something happens, you know, like what's going to happen to a kid who's surrounding a bus driver? Are they just going to be, you know, go before and you'll get a warning and nothing will happen to them? Because we don't have space. We've got overcrowded jails. Like what, like well, this is a question on? for society, but certainly we would feel, in, especially in relation to related assaults on our own members, that certainly the deterrent isn't there and people don't seem to correlate the, the idea of a, a negative impact for them, for their actions. And look, we, we, have, to, we have to, of course, we embrace diversion. There's, there's, it's not all about punishments, it's about pe keeping people on the right track. Mm. But for certain people who insist on being recidivist offenders need, I suppose, more stick and less carrot. Brendan, you're saying like there's just not the resources, but there's the resources there, but not the personnel. How many more guards do you need on the street? How many more people would you need today, do well, you say, to police the country properly? Well, we, we often compare ourselves... In the GRA, we look at Scotland, perhaps, as a model, because it's a similar demographic, it's a similar spread of population. You have urban areas and you have the, 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 the rural serious, areas. Yeah. Like So S Police Scotland have, in the region, of 17,000 sworn officers. So the government target is for 15,000 guardian. Now, it has been acknowledged that's, that's, that, uh, that's not a ceiling, but that's what they aspire to. But certainly, we would say, in and around 17,000 sworn guardian, with our, obviously, backup staff and backroom for the guardian How many do staff. we have? We have, uh, in, in the region, of 14,100. Mm. So, but the number Numbers are falling, which is very alarming. At a time of development, and we hear this talk about this, the organisation is growing, but the number of people wearing a blue uniform that are available to answer the types of calls that when, when Tom's colleagues press that emergency button or send a text, the people simply aren't there to respond or they're at another call and they're running from pillar to post trying to keep, yeah. On, yeah. To keep on top of an ever-evolving demand and increasing demand in our members. Yeah, and certainly uh, someone who joined the Guards in the 80s and 90s, you know, they'll end up better off than someone who joins the Guards now with, you know, pay scales and pension and everything like that. Like, that's, that has been decreased. And we've got an increasing population, which, of course, is having an effect on, you know, our bus and rail services. When you suspended, uh, when, when the routes were suspended in West Halla, do you see more of this happening across the country? Because there's just areas that you can send your drivers into. Well, the, red, the, the action in West Halla could possibly be replicated in the other hotspots because the drivers in those areas are so we're not driving in there, we don't feel safe, we're tired of the attacks as well. It was because of the, the, the huge spike in West Halle uh, that it's come to this, there's a, there's a meeting today of, of, of the companies, the trade unions, uh, public representatives, and it's up to the public representatives in the community uh, to put a permanent solution in place. But 
just a record of antisocial behaviour in West Tyler going back 30 years. And you can go into the archives and pull out articles and just remove the date. It's the same thing over and over. So whatever's put in place has to be a permanent solution. And we don't want this Groundhog Day where every couple of months uh, buses are being withdrawn because the solution is temporary or there's, there's extra resources thrown at it for a couple of weeks and, and then they're removed. A, and it's important to say it's not just West Tyler, this is areas no, around the country. That's just an example. But there's not going to be any more Gardaí coming to your help. Like they, they just don't have the resources. I mean, how does the Oireachtas then... Uh, ensure recruitment of more uh, Another thing is the, the fear factor. We've been calling for mandatory sentencing for attacks on frontline workers, like guards, uh, bus and rail workers, as a deterrent. The deterrent isn't there currently. People can commit these crimes and, 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 and not necessarily uh, receive any punishment. Any punishment. Are, are you seeing a fall off in, in people who want, who want to be bus drivers or rail drivers? Uh, you've, or is it still steady, steady numbers? No, I mean, you see in the reports uh, about difficulty to recruit, you've yeah. seen the signs on the sides of the buses, uh, advertising for bus drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody's going to go to work uh, in the knowledge that they're going to be racially abused, sexually abused, threatened, uh, spat at, you know, some of the most vilest things. What do you make of mandatory sentencing, Brendan? I know we have to... Well, it's something that we've con continued to call for in our association for all frontline workers. And I suppose what COVID has taught us is that how essentials, what services are essential. And we see our colleagues like bus drivers providing that essential service. So anyone that's on the front line of delivering services and are receiving these attacks certainly deserves protection of legislation. And we believe mandatory sentence may be a way forward because certainly what's in place at the minute isn't acting as no. a deterrent. Yeah, we certainly love it. It. yeah, we'd love to hear what you think about 96111. Tom O'Connor, Assistant General Secretary of the National Bus, uh, National Bus and Rail Union and Brendan O'Connor, President of the Guard the Representative Association. Thank you so Thank you much for, for joining, joining us. Thanks. And if you want to take part in this poll that is on screen right now, all you got to do is open up your camera app and scan the QR code on screen to vote in the poll. Do you feel safe on public transport? You can let us know there. Now, lots more still to come on RLDM. and we'll see you in a few minutes. Now this morning, Derek is at one of the country's most popular visitor attractions. Reveal all, Derek. Yes, Al, I feel like a young fella here this morning because I haven't been back to the National Wax Museum since I was 12 years old, I think, on a school tour. Anyway, Sharon is with us this morning. Sharon, good morning to you. Hi, Derek. And Sharon, this place has changed so much since I was a young fella. Yeah, it was probably in one of our previous locations. We've had a couple of new additions. Um, I don't know if you saw our beautiful Enchanted Forest back then. Uh, I think it's probably... Yeah, too, yeah, that's new. That. So let's talk about the Enchanted Space because that's a really fun space for kids, yes. isn't it? Um, it's a beautiful... Beautiful. There's beautiful artwork everywhere. It kind of focuses on Irish myths and folklore and just people out of uh, Irish mythology and it's just a fast, fantastic place all around. And what do you actually do at the museum here yourself then, Sharon? Um, I look after the gift shop myself and then just kind of uh, do the front desk as well, deal with customers and just check all the figures are in order. Now, you also have a fantastic haunted space, not good for just Halloween, I think for any time of the year as yes. well. I had to run through it, pretty spooky. It's people's favourite or least favourite place because <laughs> it's very effective at what it does for sure. Yeah, but does that, you get a good scare and a good spook in there as yes, well. Yes, definitely. Now, we're going to go on a walkie-talkie in a few moments' time, but first up, we have a room just down the, the road from us, and it is the Sports Star Room. And who have we got in this room? Because we've, there's lots of sporting icons, isn't yes, there? Yes, so we've got some interesting personalities in there. We've got Conor McGregor. Okay, Conor um, McGregor, USC fame, right? Yes, and we've We've got George Best as well. Yeah, famous, Pretty. famous footballer. And I saw the likes of, we had Sean Kelly on the bike, uh, Eddie Mackin, the show jumper. Yes. Yeah, fantastic show jumper. And of course, I think I'm seeing uh, through the window, Jack Charlton, of course. Yes. USA 94, which has had the whole country, you know, with them on that. Anyway, tell us about the room we're in now. Right, so this is the children's paradise. Well, it's not just for the children, but the children love it. So behind me, you can see the Joker. Okay. Um, then we've got Superman over here. Oh, yes, just... I'm spotting him there. And of course, yes. I am a big fan now of the Harry Potter series. Well, you're in the right place. I'm in the right space, <laughs> right? Exactly. Yes. Um, Which is great. And who have we got there behind us then? We've got Peppa Pig and we've got the Simpsons as well. So it's really, we've got something for every age group in here. Yeah. It's just great crack for And everyone. I spotted it over there in the corner. We have got SpongeBob yes. Square. <laughs> so this is really perfect for the kids. But we're coming into a room, I suppose, which is really my favourite room on the walkthrough. Tell I'm us about the same. it. This is Father Ted's room. As you can see, there's Father Ted, my absolute favourite figure in this oh, place, no. and Father Dougal Father as well. Where is Mrs Doyle? 
<laughs> She's not here yet, but she might come to she visit someday. Come. And look, yes. we're in the presence of royalty here this morning because we have got Gay Byrne, legendary broadcaster. And of course, yes. who have we got here? Pope Francis himself. And so he paid us a visit, was it 20? 2018, 2018, I think. 2018 yes. as well. And finally, I am loving this room as well because we're coming into all the sports and movie stars. And first up, who have we got here? So we have got Liam Cunningham here from Game of Thrones um, and the dragon as well. Of course. And then Ronan Keating. Yeah. <laughs> you say best when you say <laughs> nothing, nothing at, at all. all. Exactly. exactly. Now tell us about who we've got here. So this is Phil Lynott. We've got him here and we've got his mother, Philomena, oh, Philomena. as well. We met yes. Philomena quite recently as well. Uh, Famous, famous singer here, who have we got from the north? Van Morrison. Van Morrison, my brown-eyed girl. Uh, some famous rock stars here in the corner, who have we got here? Yes, Sharon? this is you two, but a lot younger than they look like now. Is that David Bowie I spot down the back yes, there as well? Yes, and Bob Geldof behind him and as well. And Bob Geldof behind yes. him. And here, of course, we couldn't, we couldn't enter the museum, uh, the Wax Museum, without saying hello to... To Jetward. Jetward, John yes. and Edward Grimes. I believe they paid a, a, a few visits here, haven't Yes, they? they've been by a couple times and they're big fans, we're big fans, it works out perfectly. Who have you got visiting as well? Has any, any um, celeb come in and visited? Yes, you? quite a while ago it was Ryan Tuberty as well. Oh, and then the most recent one would have been uh, Bono Lookalike. Okay, so we're kind of missing something from this museum. Yes, Thank you so much. Actually, where can we find you online? Uh, waxmuseumplus.ie. Plus.ie, waxmuseumplus.ie. So the only thing I think we're missing here is a figurine of Alan, Warren, and Tommy. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I don't think it's your day. We're going to head into the the hall of mirrors. We'll catch you later on. Back to studio. Thanks very Bye. much. <laughs> you should be in there, I Alan. Like the salmon sausages I should be there. I Pope Francis and Father Ted and then Gay Byrne had just popped in for a cup of tea <laughs> and was sitting there as well. Oh, you will, you will, you will. Day. That would have been a great day. Like, Gay Byrne <laughs> beside Alan Hughes. There, there you go. go. That's you what it is. Television royalty. Why should I be in there? Because you've been due from your roundabout days when you were <laughs> talking about was the ad? What was the ad? The ESP at uh, now, still to come. Come on, Tommy. Uh, this morning, that's with the stars. Suzanne Jackson is going to talk literary costumes and magical moves. Jack O'Keefe is serving up a, a healthy dish in the kitchen. And we'll have uh, all the goss from last night's opening Winter Love Island episode. So that's lots more still to come. We'll see you in a few minutes. Oh, Maybe you're you. not going to be here. <laughs> Welcome back to Ireland AM. It's lovely to have you with us. Coming up, she's aimed to clinch this year's coveted glitter ball trophy. Suzanne Jackson is going to be talking about shimming her way onto the couch for a chat about this year's Dancing with the Stars. She really looks the part now, I have to say. Fantastic. Very impressive. Also, this year's Winter Love Island contestants welcomed its first partially sighted contestant alongside a farmer and the makeup artist to the stars. We'll be chatting about this year's lineup a little bit later on. Right, which one was the farmer? He's famous. He's got he's a famous TikTok farmer. Oh, is I'm he? not joking, he's got like okay. a million followers on TikTok. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now we move over Bert and Ernie. Jack and Alan are in the kitchen. <laughs> What's coming up, guys? Well, Tommy, you hungry this morning? Jack says it's healthy, but uh, the jury's out in that. We're talking about lamb kebabs. Yeah, look, I can make it healthy if you want. But how <laughs> would you make a lamb kebab healthy? Look, you just watch the amount of fat that's in your lamb mince. Oh, okay. Other than that, everything else. This is a healthy-ish dish. Healthy-ish? Nice in moderation. Okay, so why, why have we got this in our So we got some lovely flatbreads to make up our kebab. Then we have all our veggies, we have our lamb mince, we have our spiced flour and some mint to top it up. We're going to make an awesome garlic yogurt dressing. A big, big kebab. Big, dirty kebab. Right in. First thing on a Tuesday morning. There you go. Now, let's check in with Derek. He's uh, still at the Waxwork Museum in Dublin. Good morning, Derek. Oh, yeah, there he is, having a cup uh, of tea. Quite a cold, quite a frosty and wintry start. Yeah, look who we've got for company. Just wait the camera around there. Good morning to Gay Bird. Uh, one or two sugars there, Father Ted. And we're still looking for Mrs. Doyle. Anyone for a cup of tea? Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. <laughs> it's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. It's headlined on who insists he did not breach electoral spending limits. Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform, Pascal Donoghue, has insisted he breached no spending limits by accepting an offer from a friend to erect posters for him in his constituency during the 2016 election campaign. 
Finn Fall backs in battle Donoghue and Rao over election expenses. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. Finn Fall will back Pascal Donoghue over his mm. failure to declare election donations as long as there are no further revelations about the public expenditure minister. The examiner leads with homes at risk as landlords quit. The exodus of landlords from the rental sector due to selling up is putting households at immediate risk of homelessness. Housing charity Threshold has warned. The mayor goes with pray for Christy. Aslan singer Christy Dignam is receiving palliative care at his home, his devastated family revealed yesterday. The Crazy World hitmaker was admitted to hospital last year with complications for a long-running blood disorder. The Sun leads with that same story. There are no words. We're devastated. Christy Dignam's bandmates have told of their devastation at hearing he is receiving palliative care. The Herald's front page goes with Monster jailed for 19-hour horror ordeal. A man who broke into his ex-partner's home and terrorised her in an ordeal that lasted almost 19 hours has been jailed for seven years. And the Star's front page, front page jail for online affair hitman plot. A man who tried to hire a hitman to kill a couple that were exchanging intimate online messages with his now ex-wife has been jailed for four and a half years by the Central criminal court. And finally, tourist tax just to stay in Dublin is the top story on the Daily Mail. Rural TDs and the hotel industry are gearing up to fight a plan to bring a new Dublin hotel room tax. A report released yesterday shows a tax on overnight accommodation could raise more than 12 million euro a year for the cash-strapped capital. I didn't yeah, know the was capital was cash No, I didn't Dublin know that cash either. Strapped. Um, Dublin like, City Council cash strapped. It's only 28 million they were spending on that uh, canoe place, was it? Down in the down uh, yeah. Grand Canal? Yeah. yeah. Sure, they're not. They've got, they've got no money, though. Um, we were chatting it's, earlier on about the increase of incidents, uh, like attacks on drivers, behavior, antisocial yeah. behaviour on buses and trains yeah. across the country. And we've got lots of texts from you. We were asking you to get in touch with us. And Lisa said, my 18-year-old son was on his way home from town to Clondalk and at 5.30 in the evening, he sat upstairs at the front seat and a group of four or five teenagers sat behind him and started taunting him. They poked the back of his head, began spitting at him. Nobody helped him. He walked downstairs. They continued spitting on him. He got off the bus halfway home and contacted me. So I collected him and he was traumatised. Of course he is. Like, I mean, you would. And, 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 Bring, we must bring up the poll on this Please, as well yeah. because we want to hear from you. Do you travel, travel on public transport? And do you feel safe on public transport if you do? We'd love you to get in touch with us, a yes or no. The little code will be coming up in the corner there. But at the moment, uh, people are saying that no, they don't feel safe. 86% yep. of people we'll, don't feel safe. We'll get that up on there. Public transport. Um, there. Jen said my neighbour so was telling me. So get involved. Me. Uh, hold your camera over the little graphic in the corner. Uh, Jen said my neighbour was telling me he witnessed a bus driver being attacked. Passengers on the bus tried to help, but the couple in question threatened to bite the driver's nose off. So this was obviously in a place where there was no cab, where the driver yeah. was protected, because we all know on certain buses there isn't a uh, cab like that. Um, there was nothing anyone could do and it was horrifying it's a, for the driver but even it's, even with that young young man 18 and if you were sitting around that and there was five teenagers taunting and spitting at him you'd feel if I got up and started intervening that I was going to get a box in the head or I'm going to like you know I so know. people are terrified to even start to get involved in something like but that when you feel know, you should whatever about boxing you hear about knives you hear oh, yeah. about different forms yeah. of things that people are carrying you just don't know yeah. who you're going to yeah. be talking to and I think Mark Margaret's point is really interesting here. Regarding on social behaviour, there has been a huge increase in aggression in general following COVID. I don't know if it's following COVID, but people have been uh, very entitled and very angry at the world. This is in restaurants, being verbally abusing staff, some shops and public transport. And I think it's something you said before. I completely agree yeah. with that. That people just, there's an aggressive tone with a lot of people. People just seem frustrated. And it's every day the newspapers, yeah. I find everything on television doesn't help that yeah. it's all just about violence and but it yeah. does feel like you know on the roads everyone feels angry like no one waves and says thank you for letting them out it's just i gotta go and in rush, shops rush, rush, yeah. you know, shouting at shop assistants or just pretending they're not there it just feels awful 0896 triple one triple one if you use public transport regularly or you work on public transport we would love to hear you I hear from you maybe you think it's actually going well so we'd love to hear from you yeah that. absolutely now after the break jack o'keefe he's going to put a smile on our faces but what we need is with a lamb kebab in the kitchen be shortly
Now, we're all trying our best to get less takeaways, but sometimes that can be easier said than done. Well, we know one person who loves a takeaway yeah. over there. Just aren't you? <laughs> Jack O'Heekeep is here, <laughs> and he's got a healthy takeaway option for us instead. <laughs> Hiya, Jack. Sorry, we're a bit sagging, off, there, was it? sagging off more in there. <laughs> um, so, yes, lamb kebabs. My twist on a donut kebab. Oh, Easy way gorgeous. to go home, right? Or a shish kebab, whichever. So, what's to start off... Can I ask you, what's a shish kebab and a donut shish kebab? Shish kebab is actually this, where it's formed around a kebab skewer, whereas a donut is that big, massive, lovely lump of meat that's up in the oh, air and you okay. can carve it. Right. Look, I it's haven't the closest had one of those you can since do... I was a student, no, to be fair. Yeah. Don't lie to me, you had one Sunday night. Oh, I didn't, know. I haven't, <laughs> honestly, but I used to love it as a student covered in garlic sauce. So it's, this is fun, and the reason it's healthy-ish, it's healthier than the actual takeaway. It's real food cooked at home, so it's as yeah. good as it possibly can be for you. Mints. Right. To make, to make it, what we're going to do is grab some lamb mince from your local butcher or your supermarket, pop in a tablespoon of flour. That's going to help it bind together so it won't fall apart when it's on the skewer. A whole egg goes in. And then inside this little spice mix, I have some cinnamon, cumin, coriander and paprika. Is lamb mince more expensive than the ordinary mince? It it's is. a little bit more expensive than beef, min mm. uh, beef mince. If you kind of want to be really healthy, you could use turkey mince or chicken mince. Okay. And then on top of that, a little bit of garlic, some sesame seeds just for a crunch. Sesame seeds? Yeah, I love putting sesame seeds and stuff, and they kind of give it this really kind of umami kick to it. Some oregano, and then with a pair of gloves on, just massage it until it all comes together into a smooth meatball. Just keep working. You see the way I'm squishing it between my fingers as well? Yeah. So it's kind of almost kneading it like as if you're making bread at home. Just getting all the flavour worked in. Ideally, you'd leave this marinade overnight if you can. Oh, okay. So. But look. Prepare like, it the day before. Yeah, 10 minutes is fine. And what does that do then that it's, it's overnight? Just, just gets the flavours in, flavors and it helps it the better. flour and everything bind in. Once you have a few meatballs like that, just roll them out into a sausage shape in between your hands, pop them on your tray, stick your skewer in, and into the oven at 220 for about 15 minutes, and it's done. Why bother putting the skewer in? Just because it looks cool on TV. Okay. But I mean, you're going to give <laughs> it like, take I mean, it out. No, but you're taking it out to yeah. make the kebab, so there's no point in putting there the is skewer no, in. Look, you are wasting, you, you're, you're throwing <clears> you're, stuff in the bin. Yeah. But, if you're having a dinner party and there's loads of people coming over, and it is like kind of cool to stack them all up in a big oh, yeah. sharing platter. Oh, like for this, for yes, what we're no, doing, no, no reason whatsoever. Well, it looks good, eh? That works <laughs> yeah. perfectly. Yeah. Thanks, Alan, for being <laughs> shooting straight. Right. Okay, lovely. Now, so for I... a garlic sauce, I have some natural yoghurt in here. A lamb meatball. And then we're going to pop in some garlic, loads of garlic. You know the best kebab sauce is always riddled in garlic. Big time. You wake up the following morning with a burp and you go, oh, I definitely had kebab last night. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, what, what's the what's the salt? So natural yogurt. Just natural yeah, yogurt. Okay, salt, right. pepper and garlic. Blend it till it's smooth. And it gets nice and runny as well, which is great for dripping over your, your lamb. This, I honestly, this is taking me back to my yeah, student, student days. I'll, right. Especially in dripping. Mm. Some flatbread or naan bread. <laughs> I get my uh, flatbreads in the Asian market, in their freezer section, because you're getting the really good naan breads that they would use in a kebab shop. And if you have kids, it's nice to get these little smaller ones as well, so they're not overloading on carbs. Why are they in the freezer section? Just because they are. They're oh, frozen products. Right. Yeah, I could have made my own, I suppose, couldn't I? I could have said that. I was busy last night making my own flatbreads. Yeah, how could you go to the <laughs> freezer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're just building it up now. Building it up. Shredded iceberg lettuce. Some thinly sliced tomato. Mmm. Yum. Right. How long Sliced did you cucumber. say the uh, meatballs go into the into the oven for? 15 minutes at 220, so they get that lovely colour on them then. OK. You're putting in some onion as well. I'll yeah. be putting on onion. Oh, definitely. Pop in your lamb. Are they gone cold now? Oh, you're giving two. Oh, yeah. Man, I'm a yeah. feeder, Alan. The crew behind the cameras here aren't yeah, happy going, now. They're happy going, about that now. <laughs> Don't where's, waste them on him. Where's the, our food? Yeah. <laughs> right. Or you could have just given us one now and given the crew a few now. Some raw onion. What are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> some scallion. <laughs> uh, oh, here we go. And then some of the sauce, garlic the yogurt top. sauce over it. Oh, yes. You're not expecting us to eat that live on air, are you? I am, yeah. Get that into your mouth now. Definitely. You don't want hot uh, sauce, Alan? No. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I'll pass on the hot sauce. What? Well. Yeah, thank you. Jack. Why, what's the sriracha it's, sauce, yeah, it's is awesome. it? No. Yeah. And it's the extra hot one. Oh, no, no, gee, no, no, that would, that <laughs> would be too, way too much now. And you have cutlery? Yeah. Yeah. But you don't need cutlery for this. Well, if you want to be, like, nice and gentlemanly, you can. So there it is. So that's... And it's some fresh mint on top, then. And that's it. Very and there you go. Tasty. Tommy's now, does Look that bring you back to your rugby days oh, or your student days? Student days, yeah. Um, do you know what? I'm going to take one of them off so I can give it to the crew. And I will t do this and our uh, lads. Look at that. Right. <laughs> Get that close-up shot now. <laughs> <laughs> Make eye contact with the camera while you're eating it. <laughs> mm. Is it delish? 
Yeah. Mmm. Very tasty. I just love the garlic sauce, you know. Yeah. Very tasty. Yeah. Happy with that, Alan. Yeah. Very nice. Um, Jack O'Keefe, your oh, perfect taste. So, like, so you could replace that for turkey or chicken, whatever you want. Turkey mince, chicken mince, beef mince, mince if you want. Just go nice and lean with it, and it's fun. And you know what? You, in the, coming into the summertime, you can do it on the barbecue as well. Yeah, okay, that's class. Because exactly you get that smoky it. kick off the meat. Then I'm actually going to cut mine up. Oh, you're using the cutlery. I'm yeah. using the cutlery. Look at how healthy you are, <laughs> Jack O'Keefe. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Always. No. Oh, you do. <laughs> <laughs> she was nearly topping the leaderboard at the weekend. We're going to be chatting to entrepreneur and influencer Suzanne Jackson about this year's Dancing with the Stars. We'll see you in a few minutes. Now, it's great to have you back. She's the entrepreneur, influencer, and has already been called one to watch in Dancing with the Stars. Mm. Before we chat to Suzanne Jackson, let's take a look at her in action. We just talked to the legs. How's it going, <laughs> Suzanne Jackson? How are you? Thank God, thank you. You're lo she's looking at that going, oh my God, all I can see I is mistakes. All I can see, I wasn't doing this, I wasn't doing that. Dancing yeah. with the star, what, surely you've been approached before. So what made you go, I'm going to do it this year? Yeah, we've talked about it before. It never really kind of happened. Lots of different projects were on at the time. But this time around, it just seemed like the perfect time, essentially, because I just hired my CEO, Caroline Dalton, to run my business. And I really needed to give her the full reign of the, of the company, you know, to get her teeth stuck in. And I kind of thought, right, what can I do now to kind of throw myself into something, a new project, because mm. I'm all about keeping myself going. And this just popped up and I thought, why not? And I've always wanted to do it. Like, it, you, you see the, the set, it's incredible. The costumes, everything, it's amazing. I'm loving it. I'm so happy I did I, it. I want to ask you about the CEO and the business in a second. Yeah. But it, you, you did Irish dancing and stuff. Yeah. Like, that's week one we're watching you <laughs> there. Was... I mean, it's pretty damn good. So, like, is dancing, has it always been something you did a lot of growing up? Like, did Irish dancing, did that help? for something like this? No, do you know what you would think that doing a bit of Irish dancing when I was younger would help? But no, in fact, it completely went against me because the first dance samba that we saw there, your body has to be very forward. In Irish dancing, obviously, we know to be very back. You know, you're kind of bending your knees. You don't really bend them that much in Irish dancing. You always have straight legs. So I don't know, like, I Overall, this type of dancing is something I've never done before. Like Latin dancing, your, your energy levels, the stamina I needed to have for that dance was incredible. Like I was wrecked after that dance. And then obviously ballroom we just had last week, completely different ball game as well. Your frame is so important. You do it on bent knees. Nothing I've learned in Irish dancing has helped. Although this weekend we do have something that's similar-ish, so maybe that will help. But I've just Irish started training. Irish dancing week, okay. Irish dancing week. That's it's what jive. It's jive. It's a lot of you know knee tapping, 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 yeah, tap yeah, going yeah. like that. Hmm. But you just mentioned that. Okay, I employed a CEO. Yeah. So sue me. This was this was to take up your time, so is that you couldn't because that must have been very hard. Yeah. To kind of something that you have controlled for years to go, okay, I have to hand it over. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't. Uh, it was time to hand over the business to a CEO. I'd, I had done all I could do with the company. We'd missed opportunities over the years because we didn't have the resources. Obviously, COVID wasn't a great time for us. So I just thought, you know what, for growth and for expansion, I need a CEO now to step in. And to be honest with you, I was starting to feel the burnout. I was starting to lose a little bit of the love for it because I was caught up in the mundane day-to-day -day running of the business. So to have a CEO there now take over and run it top to bottom is just such a relief for me and now I can get back into the things that I love doing like marketing and product development and focus on that on those things which don't take up as much time as say the everyday running of a business um, and then Dancing with the Stars came along but I've just engrossed myself in Dancing with the Stars I'm, uh, the office girls haven't seen me I've literally been training morning noon and night because I like to put 100% into everything so I'm focused on Dancing with the Stars at the moment and that's the main thing uh, because with the business, like your life on Instagram, it's so glamorous. 
But to run a business, it's tough going. Yeah. There's a lot of time in the office. You don't, you, people yeah. don't see the stress. And particularly, because you were kind of one of the first people to get into this. And yeah. everybody's trying to become, you know, fashion and makeup and everything else now. For you getting started, like, the work behind this, mm. is it... Has it just been become too much now? And and like the business, like because it's so so stressful as well. Yeah, there was a lot to it. It was just getting very overwhelming, and there was just the growth of So Sue was so fast. Mm. We couldn't keep up with ourselves for the for, for the last eight years. You know, it was like, just how like how do you learn to do? How did will you learn on your feet? <laughs> thrown in the deep end, like dancing with the stars. You just have to just think on your feet and go for it. And sometimes that's I think works in your favor when you don't have time to think. Mm. Because I think when you're trying to make a decision and you're giving yourself time. You you, you can't make a decision when you've time. So when you're just kind of going from day to day, you don't have time to, to think. Mm -hmm. So you just have to just go for it. And I think that was the one of the reasons why Sosu did well, because we were just doing what we loved and it was just happening so fast for us. But then it did slow down naturally with COVID. And then obviously there's a lot of competition out there now yeah. in terms of lots of makeup brands on the market. So for me, I wanted to kind of almost rebrand, rejig everything, new colorways, new different product development, new innovation. And I just don't have the time for that anymore, nor do I really you know, want to be just doing that all the time. I, I like to kind of varied, um, I suppose, goals and opportunities. Mm. So I needed to bring people in to help take over parts of the business that I just wasn't enjoying anymore. I think it's kind of a testament to go so far. Without having a professional CEO doing this, like this was just you on your feet learning as you go. And I remember you were in here, was it the last time you were in, you were here discussing the science of fake tans, yeah. like PHAs and AHAs and uh -huh. hydro acids and everything yeah. like that because DHA. Yeah. DHA. Mm -hmm. So that's like, I know. You, you, you know, have to know everything. A few years ago when you were like, that going, is her business. I'm an, I'm, <laughs> no, I get that. I get that. But it's like, you know, that's what you had to get down to to that element yeah. of kind of going, okay, so the European agency have changed the rules about what can put it, the ingredients that we can use. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Were you raging with them? Are you raging. like, lads? Raging. Raging. I spent years developing Drip and Gold, like two <laughs> years developing that formula. And next of all, I felt like I got a knock on the door going, no, nope, take it off the market. So obviously the DHA regulations came in last year. It was like, you couldn't have anything over 10% DHA, which is the ingredient that help, that dyes the skin, essentially, that gives you the tan. And us Irish women love a tan, mm. of course. <laughs> so um, I went and I re formulated it and yeah but it's back on the market now but it was off the market for 10 months almost yeah. we just brought our ultra dark mousse back to the market literally only oh, a couple of weeks ago and that was our best seller for Kohar which is my tan business so I have two businesses the makeup business and the tan business and so obviously revenue was down for us last year so that was a bit of a kick in the teeth because yeah. you still have the same amount of staff you still have the same amount of outgoings in terms of resources and stuff but this is the year for tan again and I have perfected my formula took my time didn't rush it to get it back on the market in mm. April and it's amazing so go get your fake like tan ten yeah. winter love that. island gals you can look yeah. like them yeah. all I mean, 10 months without your best product yeah. though mm. like it's tough as you say like you have staff that you're yeah. trying to keep on you have to mm -hmm. keep paying their wages like Absolutely. these are the difficult sides of it as well yeah. your, your husband as well Dylan like do you kind of He's in the background he's there. there. He's oh, there he is. Hi, Dylan. How's it going? Does this give you a bit of time? Like, was there a burnout between the two of you as well? Is it hard to kind of yeah. work that balance of being in a relationship and have business and other ideas and things going on as well? Like, what do you two do to try and kind of keep things going? Yeah, well, like Dylan would always say to me when we come home in the evenings, right, Suzanne, no more talk about business because we, we literally were just talking about business morning, noon and night. And you do fall into that trap because it's your baby, you know, when it's your own business. And I always say, to, I always thought, you know, no one can run your business like your own self, you know, because your passion that you bring mm. to your own company. And Dylan is fantastic on the business side, the financial side. He's very, very good in terms of, you know, his mind in terms of the business, the end. I'm the creative person. Mm. I'm very good at marketing and very good at product development. So we, we work well together, but I remember at one point he was like, right, Suzanne, from five o'clock onwards, we're not talking about business, you know? So it doesn't really work all the time. But I, hear now he, but I hear now he's there. coaching with you, that yeah. you go home, you look at your performance, he's like, I don't know about that now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seriously? Much. Yeah, Dylan, so we record every day. I know, he's brilliant. <laughs> he's, over there. he's over there going, kind of kick the leg more, do this. I swear, I'm like, are you a secret dancer in your old life or something? So we record our dances every day, um, myself and Michael. So he basically, Michael can do his notes. <laughs> Wow. I come home and show them to Dylan and Dylan's like, we could have extended a little bit more there and all, I swear. This is it. Was the first impressive. dance amazing? Your first dance? Samba. But... No, your first dance with Dylan oh, at the wedding. No, we were like at the Debs, <laughs> going from foot to foot. <laughs> Literally. The school, the no, Dylan doesn't dance, but he's <laughs> listening to me. He knows what's he's doing. Well, best of jive. Is that what you said? Jive, jive on Sunday. Sunday, yeah. Wow. 
Best of luck. I'm looking thank forward you. to it. Thank you. are doing absolutely fantastic. The standards are really high. Thank it's you, amazing guys. to watch you. Susanna Jackson, Sam. thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Look Cheers. Forward to seeing you there. Sounds great. Now, after the break, we are hitting the catwalk. We'll see you back here very shortly. Hello. Now, the new year brings a whole host of new trends. And here to give us a rundown of what we can expect from the world of fashion is stylist Lorna Duffy. From the world yes, of fashion, the world, Lorna. That's, that's a lot. That's a, that's a heavy to weight present on your this shoulder. morning, Alan. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure on me now. Thank you for that. Um, yes. So we're kind of just teeing, tying in lots of those key trends for 2023, um, <laughs> but they're going to take us through for the next couple of weeks and the next couple of months as well. So... Um, yeah, and we're keeping it nice and budget what friendly. Are, what are the key trends? What are we going to be Do you know what? At? There are actually so many. So I didn't have an easy job this morning. I had to tie it down to just four looks. Um, what you're got... starting off with first is something yeah. that I'm hearing about yes. absolutely everywhere. And this is the cobalt, the blue. Yes. The blue. So We've got Kelly really, with the first look this morning. really, really dark, vibrant blue. So, for example, Alexander McQueen, huge fan of the cobalt blue this season. And we're also tying it into another one of my favorite trends, which you probably know by now, because I've, I've had a few on over the last couple of months, the power suit. How stunning is this on Kelly? So obviously, um, so first off, this outfit is from Get That Trend, that really vibrant blue. We are going to be seeing it so, so mm. much over the next couple of weeks, over the next couple of months. And um, a blazer, again, it's just a really nice structured fit. The length, just the detailing, I just absolutely love it. So it's really nice, obviously, for maybe a work look or you could definitely mix it up. Oh, totally, yeah. You know, you could go for a casual look, throw a pair of trainers, we've got the heels, you know, you there's lots of ways. Just put a little black top with it. We've got a nice little simple sort of cowl neck black cami yeah. top underneath as well. Really, really nice and simple. Um, again, you could add a bit of lace under there, underneath there if mm -hmm. you wanted to. Go for a nice casual white tee as well if you wanted to go for, I suppose, an extra casual look. And then we've got a really nice pair of trousers as well. So we've got a very slightly cropped pair, got a little bit of slit there. So obviously, you know, you can, you know, the power suit with the kind of a typical cigarette style yeah. is very much like, in. Can I just a ask you, what, like when you're going for that cropped leg, is that, mm. would, would some women go away from that and go, oh, um, that so wouldn't suit people, me? Some people, yeah. So again, it comes down to preference definitely yeah. at the end of the day. Um, but I think, do you know what? It's a little bit different, so it's nice. So I feel like, if there's something you're going to do this year, just, you know, push the boat out a little, try something a bit different. I just think, again, it's quite nice. It's a little bit different. Um, and I think those strap sandals definitely complement that particular type of trouser as well. These are from Murphy's Shoes, a nice suede pair of strap sandals. And, and you just nice put a little clutch heel. bag with it in. Yes, so you've gone for um, a nice sort of um, a suede clutch. There is a little chain in there if you wanted to pop it over and mm. use it as a cross body bag as well. Very, very nice. Obviously, you've gone for a slightly more dressy look. You know, you could easily, again, as I said, go for a more casual look. But again, a very, very nice bag. I love that index finger ring. Yes, you know, yes. You know how I love to layer my rings. Marie. Yeah. This is absolutely beautiful. So all of our jewellery in this look and our next three looks are from individual jewellery. We've gone for a beautiful, beautiful pair of shooting star chain link earrings. Um, really good price point. And again, just as we for a dressy sort of a weekend look with our power suit here, um, I think those kind of slightly sort of statement style earrings are quite nice and then we've gone for lots of layers with our rings this morning gorgeous little cross spring priced at 34 and they go up to 46.99 so yeah Thank nice you. little mix cool. there next up floral next up we have ursula in this beautiful floral print so again i know we always say it coming into spring, you have to look at furls. However, it's true, they always come back for spring. So absolutely beautiful. We're taking inspiration from Prada here, Fashion Week, just the nicest, subtle, dainty floral prints. Really like the high neck here. Um, it's quite fitted at the waistline mm -hmm. and just that long sleeve and just that midi style as well. Beautiful, beautiful dress for my kind of dress. This one here is available in lots of sizes from a small to an extra large as well. And just those lighter, kind of the, the kind of the pink hues with the whites, the yellows and the greens. Yeah. All about adding just the subtle yeah. pops of color into our into our wardrobe. Yeah, and it will match with anything on there. So yes. Grand. And then beautiful pair of um, sort of leather um, nude strap sandals as well. Lots of um, sizes available. And they just tie in again nicely with the colors and the dress. And of course, our little crossbody bag, which is just so cute. This is definitely a me bag. I love that there's a strap 
but there's also the little handle there. So two different ways to wear it. Very, very nice. And, and it ties here, in. Then. And then we have some really, really nice pieces again. So we've got a gorgeous little um, beaded spike bracelet. Again, really good price point. Two little um, chains as well, uh, just to tie in nice with a little chain strap bag. Very, very cute. Um, and we had some little um, hooped earrings, earrings there. as well. Yeah, so very, very cute. Uh, again, very, very subtle and dainty because obviously there's a lot going on with our print. So yeah, kind exactly. Of, we're, we're kind of, yeah, we're to turning down with our jewellery. Ursa, yeah, that's lovely, lovely on you. Very, Thank very nice. You. Yumiko is coming out with our next look, uh, Pastels. Yes, this oh, is very, this. very cute. Oh, I, love, I this. love this. So here we are looking at that candy floss pink. Obviously, the last couple of months, we've seen those really vibrant hot pinks. We've seen the magenta shades. We're very much now looking at our pastel shades, our candy floss pinks, Victoria Beckham, absolutely went mm. hell of a leather for the candy floss pink. This is very um, unusual, though, the way this there. is. The way Isn't it's it? just tied. You it's are, really, the really top, obviously, the shop. Are they? Yeah. The this top year. doesn't come with it underneath. You have no, to put a little throw, cami or something that's exactly on underneath. It. So it's a sort of a vest style, but again, obviously, it's freezing. We want some sort of a knit. I had to include some sort of a knit this morning. Uh, but again, it's very, very cute. I just love the way it ties on the sides. Um, you could throw a nice little white crisp shirt under there if you wanted to. Obviously, you've just gone for a very simple white top underneath Yeah, they well. are going for half a is, jumper this season. Is mm. that actually tied that you can't open it? So you can actually open it. Oh, you so you can, can kind of adjust it, it as right. you want as well. Okay. So if you wanted, you could even go with like a nice white rib neck, kind of a rib long sleeve jumper if you wanted to as well. I mean, so, who needs a full jumper? Exactly. Who needs, who needs, needs a full one? jumper? Two who big just... <laughs> slits on the <laughs> side of your jumper. You get a nice <laughs> bra. If you got a nice bra, <laughs> show it off. It'll be fine. Then we've you also got a really nice pair of jeans. Would you? It's freezing. No. No, but in the summer we I'd like a full jumper. We've also got a gorgeous pair of high waist jeans from On Trend as well. And then of course, a nice pair of simple white trainers just to finish off our very casual but cool look on Absolutely. your Miko. Absolutely. Now with this, uh, the gorgeous bag as well, but the jewellery is really popping um, yes. that we can see there. Gorgeous with the kind of Very, purpley. very cute. So again, we've gone with another lovely little bag. So we've gone with a lovely little nude strap and um, crossbody bag. Again, just to go and kind of tie nicely with our casual look. I love That's gorgeous. This ocean color. ring. It's yeah. just beautiful. I think this kind of oversized statement rings. Obviously, the print, it's a bigger print, so we can afford to kind of go all out with our dainty pieces, extra layers um, as well. We've also got some beautiful sort of fan-shaped hoop earrings. Again, can be quite dainty, but again, very, very nice. Um, lots of ways to sort of dress up just and dress down. A gorgeous little necklace, a gorgeous little chain then to match in Matching nicely with our ring. Mm. So That's very, very lovely. cute. Yamika, that's lovely. I mean, haven't seen much. them. You're saying they're everywhere, those... They've yeah. kind of started appearing a few months ago. <laughs> right. Before my eyes before in the shop. Before your eyes. <laughs> now. Now. Oh, the little yeah, black yeah. dress. Yes, oh. the LBD. So... Yeah. We are just going to be seeing lots of layers with black. So we've gone for a very, very simple, traditional, yet very stylish LBD this morning. Uh, very much the a sleeves are look. fabulous. Aren't they just? Yeah, a nice great. statement sleeves, the ruffles. There's nothing I don't love about this dress. I love that high neck detailing. It's very short. Very, very cute. So what you could do is as well, obviously you've gone for a dressy look here. All right, you morality, please. Oh, but it is Calm very down. short. It's oh, very it's short. very short. <laughs> are you one of the people that texts him when I'm wearing a no, short skirt? It's, very you are. Short. it's him, it's him. It's very short. Um, so obviously if you wanted to go for a cyber contract, you could throw on a nice pair of tights, polka dot tights, heart shape. You know those print types are in. You could definitely do that. Throw on a nice pair of maybe over the knee black leather boots as well. If you want to go for a slightly more casual look. So very, very nice. Um, and then we've gone for a slightly different pair of um, sort of buckle style suede. Oh yeah, they're cool. Shoes, very, very cute. Slightly higher heel here. Mm -hmm. Again, if you're maybe you've got a girls night, night on the tiles, whatever it is, very, very cute. Um, love this little bag. So again, we've gone for a sort of chunkier style strap here. Um, very, very cute, small, you can fit all the essentials. But again, it's very much a going out bag. Yeah, Really, absolutely. really nice. And then we've got some more beautiful accessories. So we've got a Gorgeous um, pair of gold hoop earrings. A little bit bigger, but again, we can be quite dainty and quite subtle with our accessories again this morning. Absolutely beautiful. They really do have the nicest selection of pieces for day to night, all kinds of occasions. And then we've gone for some more layers for our, earrings, or for our rings, rather, yeah, should I say. Um, really, really nice um, pair. So we've got adjustable ring at 53 99 and then a beautiful statement ring at 46 99 the, the dress spoiled does not come choice. with Kelly's Absolutely dimples. Absolutely spoiled for choice. God, I love her dimples. <laughs> 
Laura, thank you so much thank for joining so us. Thank you so much. Lovely little thank look you. there. That's thank very you. nice. Her this morning. Very thank fair you. faucet. Thank you, Alan. I guess <laughs> her skirt yeah, and okay, Lynn? Yes. <laughs> Is her skirt and okay, Lynn? No, it's lovely. It's <laughs> lovely. Still to come this morning, we're going to be reviewing last night's first episode of Winter Love Island. And we've got a basketball challenge with Alan and Tommy. LeBron James, I think you can rest easy. We'll see what happens. Although you're very competitive, we'll talk to you very shortly. Are you competitive? Sitting here just chatting about Albert Rubbish. Einstein doing a bit of physics in our spare time. Uh, earlier on, we were talking about public transport. We were speaking to a representative from the National Bus and Rail Union, also the president of the Garda, uh, Garda uh, Representative Association, about the rise in antisocial mm -hmm. behaviour and the calls to have Garda, uh, a dedicated transport police. And we were asking, do you feel safe on public transport? And the results of our poll are in 16% say yes, whereas 84% say no, and overwhelmingly on the text today. It's no. People Isn't do that not shocking, feel safe. Though? Isn't that shocking that like 84% of people who took part in our poll this morning said no? And that's obviously represented across the country of people who just don't feel safe, don't think they can travel safely on, on public transport. It's, yep. it's absolutely ridiculous. Mm, yeah, Patricia, Magella, I travel. Yeah. Sorry, Tommy, go ahead. Uh, Magell just said, yeah, I've fallen on from I don't feel safe public transport. I travel a lot on public transport as I don't drive. I won't travel in the dark as I feel very unsafe waiting for buses. <laughs> it's unsafe during broad daylight, never mind when it's dark, when getting buses, I try not to get up, or end up going upstairs as I feel less safe as a woman up mm. there. Um, and Patricia says here, I travelled by bus to Dublin recently. The bus driver had to stop due to an aggressive incident with a passenger. It was scary. I couldn't believe that the exact same thing happened coming home. It was so difficult for the driver and passengers. Sure, who'd be a driver? And then they were, they were talking about uh, it, maybe it's happened since bus conductors stopped. But what could a bus conductor do? Remember uh, the no days powers. of a bus conductor? He'd have no power. So yep. He'd be terrified. Mm. He'd be in, uh, assaulted and abused as well. Yep. And he couldn't do anything because then you could sue him for assault and stuff like yep. that. Or bring him to court for assault. He's trying to protect but himself. He's the same. They have security on some of the Lewises as well, don't they? Yeah, but, but they're not the people, allowed. Yeah. The people who are causing the trouble know that the security can't do, can't anything, do anything to them. It's just unless a, it's the guards yeah. who are there to actually arrest them and take them away and, you know, sanction them. They know they can get away with whatever they want. And so. Karen is here and she was saying her 19-year-old son was on a bus at the weekend and had a terrifying experience with this couple who were screaming and shouting. There was elderly people on the bus as well. And what she was amazed was that their, her son said, will you please collect me off the bus because he was terrified in case something happened. And she was sort of saying she was amazed that when the bus came to its final stop and they were getting off with this couple still screaming, there was no guards or nobody there to sort of even to see what the whole situation just shows was the bus drivers are used to it at this yeah. stage. They just, that's what they come to expect. But even at that, guards, it has to be decided who's right for the incident. Yeah. The guard might be available to go there because it's all management. It's not like the guard from the local station can go and sort that out anymore because it's, do you, do you have the skills? So guards have levels. We've talked about this before. The guards who are allowed to put the blue lights out. I put the lights so on you might not be allowed to interact with the public on that level. The guards but mightn't it, have the right, they mightn't you, be at the right level. If you're a qualified guard... There's different levels as you go up as to what you're allowed to do. So if you're a qualified guard and you're in that station, say that pulled into a town, you can't go to that you incident because it was a public you order might, incident. There might, there might be another guard who is uh, who's trained, trained for, that. for that public order incident that they would have to try to get to go there. So that means the guard that's there in the police station can't go to Come here. It. We Come spent on. our day Let's trying to discover here, right? what guards can yeah. and can't yeah. do. That it is was, crazy. Yeah, it's that crazy. is nuts now. Come now, on. after the break, we're going to be hearing something else. Uh, this is from a victim of a serial fraudster who targeted vulnerable children. We'll see you back here in just a few minutes. <laughs> Well,
Well, from Claudia Bronwyn, Lucy Fitzwilliams to Carrie Jade Williams, these are just some of the different identities taken by just one person, Samantha Cooks. Samantha assumed various identities, conning her way into people's homes and bank accounts. One of her victims was Lynn MacDonald. She joins us now alongside journalist with the Irish Independent, Ellen Coyne. Thank you both so much uh, for joining us this morning. And we're going to get into what exactly happened with you and other people, Lynn. But first of all, Ellen, can you give us a, a, an overview Overview of this Samantha Crooks. What do we know about her? So we know that Samantha Cooks is a convicted fraudster, both in Ireland and, and in the UK. We know that she's been active in Ireland for at least eight years and she's deceived a number of people using lots of different uh, aliases and identities. She's certainly someone who's known to Gardaí in a lot of different parts of the country. And we know that she has a track record of kind of like inveigling her way into people's lives, particularly people who were going through something very difficult at the, the time, may have been vulnerable to what seemed like this angel who appeared out of nowhere. She had these incredible stories about, you know, how virtuous or brave she was, these incredible kind of like challenges that she had overcome. And yes, as you mentioned there in the intro, she certainly got her way into people's bank accounts. But um, beyond exploiting people financially, I think one of the most devastating things that she did and the worst trail that she left behind her was exploiting people's trust and people's vulnerabilities. Uh, and that is how you came across her, Lynn. You met Samantha, but under a different name. So we were introduced to the person we believe to be Lucy Fitzwilliams in 2016. So that's six years ago, Tommy, and it still, it still affects us. Wow. Um, she was introduced as a woman who had set up a women's refuge in Dunleary. Um, myself and my girls had gone through that system. So immediately there was a connection there. Um, she was introduced by a family friend who lived next door to us. And she had an autistic son who was receiving therapy from this woman also. Um, she comes across as the kindest, nicest person, genuinely. And very quickly you build up trust. And that's something I didn't have much of at that stage. Mm. Um, but I befriended her and she offered um, her services as an art therapist with my then 14 year old. I had a, I still have um, a very special little girl, Daisy, um, and Daisy has a life limiting condition. So again, she zoned in on that and would offer to sit with Daisy and watch her if I needed a shower. That's something I didn't do, thankfully, but I did give her the opportunity to spend a lot of time with my then eight-year-old child. She had no qualifications. Um, but you you and your neighbour, who were both in the, vulnerable positions. Marin, there were numerous people at that stage. She um, told us about a trip to Lapland she had organised through the Women's Refuge for families who needed a lift. And we were a family who needed a lift. And um, we paid our deposits and Again, just like Ellen said, the money doesn't come into this. It's it's the trust that we had built up in this person. And she just took that from us. It is very hard six years on to trust anybody. Just to, to get this, because when I was, because I, there's, I think I'd come across this woman under a different guise in Kerry a few years ago when she brought herself to national attention for something else. For ye, this was Lapland, you know, people need a lift and you did, Daisy's got life limiting condition. Your other daughter, Ellie, she was, she yeah. was sitting with. So she basically said that she, she didn't have charity status yet, but she was a millionaire. Yes. She was, you know, she was a religious woman. She had set up this women's refuge is what she said, which is just apparent when there was no women's refuge. Yeah. And she didn't want you paying the full cost. She was going to incur some of the costs so you could pay half price for your children to have this once in a lifetime and, experience. And my mum, and Ellie's best friend who had CF, her mum. There were up to 100 families involved in this Fraud. trip to Lapland, all conned. And how much money was she going? There was a deposit, a cheque out of a de deposit of £20,000 ready to be handed over. And thankfully, she was exposed the day before. The day before? And it was Hilary, um, my friend who had introduced me um, she went to the hospital, she had collapsed in Dunleary and she needed a contact. Hilary arrived and said, I'm here to collect Lucy Fitzwilliams. 
we don't have anybody here by Lucy Fitzwilliam. She said, well, she had been brought in by ambulance at such and such a time. And she said, oh, you mean Samantha, she's in cubicle three. And that was the first time any of us had any inkling that something was amiss. So this hospitalisation, Ellen, this is where it all really started to unravel, obviously with the name and then other stories, I'm sure, started to come through from there. Yeah, but I suppose the, the one tra solid track record that Samantha has is when she's caught out, like, you know, maybe if it's uh, something like that, or if she's arrested and before the courts, as she was in 2011, for frauding a UK couple out of uh, their savings by posing as a surrogate, it's no barrier to her. She'll go to another town, she'll assume a new identity, and she'll start all over again. And we know that that has happened in Ireland multiple times. And she's so brazen and her neck is so brass that over the last year, she went even further and under the false identity identity, Carrie Jade Williams, didn't just defraud people in the town of uh, Ken Mare, where she was mm -hmm. staying, didn't just deceive people there, but actually went further and kind of like curated this online identity for herself, posing as a disability advocate and writer, and went so far with that that she won like a really prestigious essay competition in the Financial Times. She was on all these podcasts talking about the accessibility work that she was doing. And I suppose the only reason that the two of us are sitting on this couch now is because she made the mistake of flying too close to the sun, um, going too far and letting her lies go viral. Because this is, I remember she was, there was this woman, this hunt, she had Huntington's disease mm -hmm. and she was fighting for disability rights. That's yeah. right. And this was under Carrie Jade Williams and it turns out that's your Lucy Fitzwilliams. Yes. Right? So uh, I remember, I think I read about her, I was uh, down in Kerry, she was in the Kerry man. And, and then she went viral again because of an Airbnb issue. Yeah. This, this was something that everyone was going, this is absolutely disgraceful. I remember there was outrage about this. What happened here, Ellen? So under Carrie Jade Williams, she, she like Carrie, Samantha, whoever, would always seem to have these incredible things happen to her where she had unbelievable adversity to deal with. So during the summer, you know, she was an Airbnb host. We've now found out that she was letting her landlord's property out on Airbnb without his permission. Um, and she went on TikTok and claimed that she was being sued by these two horrible Airbnb guests for being disabled, that they were trauma by having to be around a person with a she disability. She said that they'd been triggered by things in the house that were disability access. Oh, it was, I, I mean, it was such a tall tale. She said that she had four A4 pages of things that they needed, like weighted blankets and made to recover from the trauma. But unfortunately for her, people on the internet were quite sympathetic about it. It caught the attention of a very prominent TikTok account, which had 100,000 followers, who boosted it and were like, oh, look at this poor disabled woman who's dealing with this. Then the story went viral, then she lost control. And unsurprisingly, people who saw the video of Carrie recognised her as Samantha Cooks, the convicted fraudster from her past. And then people like Lynn recognised her as Lucy Fitzwilliams. And we're so lucky that these really strong victims came together, almost like forming a union mm. and working together to try to make sure that nobody falls for this fraudster again. Has she faced any charges for anything that she's done? Yes, so she was up before the courts for the surrogacy case in the UK. And we know that in Ireland in 2019, she was before a district court in Fermoy. Um, she had posed as a clinical child psychologist and persuaded a family to pay her over 800 euro for a, a report so that their daughter could get an SNA. Anyone who even has a cursory knowledge of how that whole system works knows that it's so difficult yeah. to get those assessments and they can cost so much money. Um, she was handed a 14 week suspended sentence. Same with the surrogacy case, she was given a suspended sentence. So while she has been before the courts, mm -hmm. as far as we know, she's never been, she's never faced any jail time. Uh, and she, because she's she's a British national and she, and she moved to, to Ireland. So when you hear all this, you were one of the people, Lynn, that spotted her. That when you saw her, you were like, Shola. I actually got a two word message from Hillary. She's back. She's back. <laughs> it, it sounds like a horror movie. You know, she's back. Because she dis after you discovered you were one day from handing over 20,000 euro, yeah. did she disappear? So three months later, we had a phone call um, from a woman called Ethna. This was the second family she went. So within in a week of leaving us, she moved into Ethna's home as um, an au pair and caused absolute havoc and damage there. Um, Ethna found a burner phone when she left and put the SIM card back into it and found our numbers and called oh, us. God, so we already had started a little link um, 
Then she just went off the radar and we tried to re rebuild ourselves, tried to rebuild trust and, you know, encourage the kids to be more open again. And when this all surfaced online, um, very quickly we found each other. And one thing uh, Samantha Cooks has done for us is bring together a group of extremely strong women who um, will do whatever we have to do to ensure that other families aren't going to go through the the torment, the heartache and the upset that we went through. Because, because it's, as you said, it's not about the money. You know, you, you and your children, you've gone through difficult times it's, yeah. and, and have found it hard to trust people and you put your trust in this yeah. woman. And even now, you're still... Like, that's the, the, the most emotional, the hardest yeah. part of this, really, and that she's done this to so many people. And for all we know, she's doing it to another family right at this moment. Do we know? We don't. We have no idea where she is. So the last sighting was truly on the 23rd of December. And again, social media has been really, really yeah. good in assisting us. And this isn't our job. So we're yeah. hoping we are just facilitating the guards so that they can actually intervene and do what needs to be done to protect other families. It's not a witch hunt. Um, we don't want anything back for ourselves, we just want to ensure other families yeah. don't have to go through this. Because this is a pathological behaviour. It's been going on for years, Ellen, and it is always vulnerable people. Yeah. that she targets, that's how she gets her And I think that that's so important because I don't want anyone to see this and think that this is some master manipulator, yeah. you know, some sort of mastermind, clever, like the fact that she has gotten so far and her lies could get so far says nothing about, you know, her skill or her like duplicity. It's more about the good faith and yes. the charity of the people that she she targeted. The reason, you know, people who take people at face value, people who would be willing to help someone out if they said that they needed it. And that causes so much damage that people like Lynn will now like second guess people, not kind of have that good faith for people anymore. It's not down to the skill of Samantha Cooks, mm. it's down to the kindness of others. I mean, it really is a fascinating, fascinating yeah. story and listen, amazing work that you're doing, Lynn, uh, and, and continue that and hopefully we'll be able to get to an end to this, Lynn McDonald, and of course, Helen Coyne yeah. with the Irish Independent. Thank you so much for coming in to, to share it all. And just, it's a, such an excellent, excellent article in the Irish mm -hmm. Independent, well worth reading, and you can um, you easily, uh, images easily available <laughs> in relation to that as well. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Stop shouting at each other. No judgment, do whatever you want. If you're sick of the wet and windy weather in January, a bit of escapism is needed. And what better escapism than Winter Love Island, which returned to Virgin Media last night. And Ali Ryan from Goss.ie joins us now to have a look back at the first episode. Good morning yes, to you, good Ali. Good morning. Um, well, look at... They all joined in last night. It's, it's always a bit boring, the first episode. Yeah. Let's have a quick look at all the, all the participants in this year's Love Island. It's okay. time to make your choice. Will it be Harris, or Will, or any of the other boys? Kai. Kai, we've got a steal. <laughs> Anime, how does that make you feel? A bit gutted. You can choose any one of these boys. But first, let's find out if any of them fancy you. Boys, please step forward if you like the look of Tanyelle. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so... I'm gonna have to go with Kai. Kai. Olivia, what's going through your head right now? I mean, it was sweet while it lasted, <laughs> I guess. Islanders, this is Tom. Oh my I'm Tom, I'm 23, and I'm a footballer of Barnsley. And I'm definitely gonna be scoring some goals in the villa. <laughs> There we go. But Ali, what did you think of it? I thought it was good. I know the first episode isn't too exciting, but there was a bit of drama, okay? Kai was chosen. 
Three times, you got mixed around quite a lot. That's very dramatic for her first episode. And Olivia is the first person who took Kai out of his couple. So it seemed like everyone was playing nice. Everyone was sticking to who was single. And she came in and she was like, I want him. But he stepped forward. He he was yes. coupled up and then somebody yeah. else came in and he There's stepped forward. There's a bold forward. glint in his eye. But a lot of people were saying last night that Olivia is going to be the new Ekin, the new Mora. She has a bold glint in her eye as well. She's the ring girl. She's an actress. She's 27, so she's technically one of the older girls. <laughs> but I know, I know. <laughs> but um, she has a real feisty personality. Um, she, oh. she was also, I want to say she's technically a Bond girl, right? Because she played a waitress on the latest James Bond movie. So she was in a scene with Daniel Craig. She was, was a waitress. She? But to me, she's a Bond girl now. So I love that. So I'd say she is out to get the fashion deals, to get the most out of it. She'll be on Dancing on Ice next year. Like, she's the one, I think, to watch. So uh, that if, if you're watching it, she was the second one that he, that Kai was yeah. with and he stepped forward to partner yeah. up with yeah. someone else and then she was gone. And when she kind of took him away from the other girl, she was like, I'll talk to you later. And I was like, oh my God, there's a bit of drama already. So that was a lot for the first episode. But I think everyone is saying the same thing. Last night, the big takeaway is that Maya Jama was born to host that show. Like okay. everyone's she, talking she about She was, her. but before we talk about her, can I just say what you're saying there? Has Love Island lost its whole identity of finding love because all they want to do is be on Dancing with the Stars next year yeah. or like getting the closed deal and that's the only reason they're going it's in It's hard, for when it. you watch interviews now with them, they're all saying, we didn't go in to find love, we went in to find fame. But then you see, like look at Tommy and Molly May, like they are expecting their first child, Olivia and Alex are married. There are a lot of couples that do find love. So I think Ekin people go Sue and Dan David Day. But yeah. they're just doing it for the TV yeah, deals. Who knows? Come on. But I'm not, there was a, a, an article, I don't know if it was on Gossier the night, and it was the couples that are still together yes. from the series. There's like six or seven There's couples with babies. I think it's more but like How many it's a people fluke. have gone through in all the series? Probably, but it might be, more <laughs> than a, it might be more than Blind Date. I mean, Dermot Bannon was on that. Oh, he didn't find his wife I on that. I think people get surprised when they actually meet someone that's genuine. Because in the house, it's all show. You can imagine, like, there's no way you're actually getting to know the real people. So, like, Tasha and Andrew, for example, last season, people hated her. They thought she wasn't in it for the long haul. I think they're going to make it to the end. I think they're going to get married. Like, they're one of the most loved couples now. So, we'll see. But they're all so young. Like, looking at the ages last night, they're all in their early 20s. Like, Molly May, when she went in, was 19. Yeah. yeah. They're very young. They're very young. So who'd be looking to settle down at that age? One girl looked like she was 13 years old. I was like, this. it was it was very And upsetting. funnily on Twitter last night, everyone was saying the guys have, are lying about their age and that they're definitely in their 30s. A lot of people think Kai is much older. I'm pretty Surely sure ITV see yeah, the all yeah. the birth yeah. like, There's they no Nadine Coyle going yeah. on there. Or the, yeah. Yeah, the passport. Yeah. That was the whole thing about Laura Anderson years ago when she was yeah. in. Anyway, we're going back to past yes. ones. Maya Jama, this was yes. the big thing. Laura Whitmore is gone. Laura was a woman who was settled with a baby and yeah. she was wearing vintage vintage clothes, yeah. wearing a lot of Irish designers, which was amazing, Joanne Hines. But this is a show for the gals. Yeah. You know, this is the gals who are scrolling on Instagram. Maya Jama, they leaned into yeah. her relationship last night, her relationship status. Straight yes. away, she was like, I know how hard it is to yes. find love. Is she or isn't she back with Stormzy? I and mean, this is why everybody loved Caroline she Black. She used to go out with them and they broke yeah. up. Then she was, going, she and was engaged to... Everyone thinks they're back together and, now. Yeah, and now they might be back together. The thing is, everybody loved Caroline because of that. Because Caroline's the girl you'd meet in the club, night, yeah. nightclub bathroom, and you'd be telling her and she'd be chatting to you. And that's what Maya's like. You could really see it last night. She had the same lingo as everyone. She was like, are you gassing? Are you happy? She was really asking the guys questions and the girls. The guys all fancy the pants of her, which helped as well. And she looked incredible. The outfits oh. were amazing. She should be in the villa like she's amazing so I think that was the big takeaway and like the host of the show gets such a hard time on social so everyone was kind of watching with bated breath but everyone was positive everyone was like this is for you I mean when Laura was hosting the show people were trying to start campaigns for her to host it which it was, was so mean yeah, it was so awful. mean so I don't know what's going to happen. I hope it stays positive, but it's it's hard out there. Yeah, it's it is it's like a poison chalice because the hosts of Love Island normally they come in, you see them for a minute and a half, and mm. then you'll see them the next week. Yeah. So it's like calm down, lads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like we'll see a little bit more of her though than we saw of Laura as well because like she's probably in South Africa most of the time. Mm. That was one of the reasons Laura stepped down because she couldn't be travelling across the like, whole time. Like this was one of her outfits last I night. Know. Like, come on lads. <laughs> I expected them all to, I mean it's winter, Love Island. It's probably a bit of polo neck. It's a pretty little thing not to do polo necks. What's going on there? It's a bit mad. What did you take away from last night then? I think it's going to be a dramatic series. I think it's so hard when you see pictures you're like, oh I don't know, but when I saw them together I think it's going to be good. They're already starting to have their chats 
Olivia is going to cause drama. She'll be crawling on that terrace any day now, like Ekin. Like, I think she's going to be a really strong character this year. And yeah, for me, the girls seem like really strong characters, and that's when you know it's going to be a good season. Yeah, we need the finger look, pointing. The boys we need looked the a bit wimpy, didn't they? A little bit wimpy. <laughs> haven't really seen much of their personality yeah. yet. And they seem kind of easygoing. Like, they didn't seem too... I don't know. I didn't really get much of their personality base, I'd say. Mm. But I, I think the girls really have. And also, we have Ron in this season, which is worth mentioning. He has a slight issue with his sight. And when he had yeah. Tasha before, she had a hearing disability. So now we have someone with a seeing disability. I think that's really important. Doing something. Because the show gets slammed for not including enough sort of people. And I think at least they're starting to do that. So yeah. I'm sure we'll see well, that play out. they have a long out. way to go now. They have a long fairness. way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Embodying Love Island for us today with the jewellery, with the sparkles. <laughs> <laughs> Ali Pretending Ryan. it's not frozen outside. <laughs> Ali Ryan from Gosta. <laughs> You gassing. Yeah. gassing. You gassing, lads. We've, we've um, eight weeks of it. Yeah, it's winter. It's fine. <laughs> this guy has been practicing, by the way, since yeah. nine o'clock. He's been outside shooting. He ran shooting out his... at nine o'clock to practice. Yeah, because there he this is. this weekend sees the National Cup basketball finals take place. Michael Jordan, how are you doing over there? You OK? Hey, this could be my last dance, guys. Yes, myself and Alan are going to be put to our faces. It's going to be uh, a competition between the two of us. See who can get it. That's coming up after the break. Here we go. Oh, it's way off. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I think you got to win, Alan. Hey, welcome back. I'm in my element He's here. Getting, he really is in his element out here. We are in the Ireland M um, court with some of Ireland's biggest and brightest basketball stars. Yeah, joining us now is Michelle Clark from Colester and Sean Jenkins from DBSN. And good morning to both of you. Now, you are here because this, this weekend is the big build-up. It's what the whole year is about. So tell us about what's happening this weekend. Yeah, we're really looking forward to it. It's the one weekend of the year that everybody wants to be involved with. Uh, ensure my house study national cup is the go-to in basketball so a uh, really big occasion and sean i mean basketball i just see is just growing in popularity all the time particularly here in ireland and having these finals and to, to play for trophies as well i mean it's, it's an exciting time of the year yeah absolutely yeah it's the most exciting time of the year like we just said you know it's the best weekend of the year we just came off a big win in that a couple of weeks ago so you know, we're looking to get the win this weekend. So much training now is going into the prep for this weekend. Is it full on every evening? Absolutely. Uh, barely a day off this week, so uh, we're full in with prep. So we're looking forward to it and excited to get going. And Michelle, we talk all the time about the, the gr rising popularity of women's sports. And we're seeing it in boxing and football and golf and everything. But basketball in particular, like it's pretty much even split yeah. between boys and girls. Is that right? Yeah, we're the only um, team sport, I believe, in the country that's a 50-50 split and it's only growing. Um, we have 79 nationalities participating across the country, so oh. it's really growing and getting really popular. So, very... and so there were huge crowds at the basketball arena then this weekend supporting you all. Yeah, you hope so. You hope so. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here. We need the big crowds at the weekend. And what does it mean to actually win it then for you? Oh, it's a big achievement. You know, it's what you work towards the whole year. You know, from the start of the season to the end. So you know, it's a great thanks to our coach, and we're just looking forward to it. You know. And how did well, you start? Sorry. How did you start? How did you start into basketball? Oh, I've been playing my whole life. You know, my mom and dad both played, so I was just born into it. Your mom and dad played? Yeah. So you were just literally, that was a natural mom, thing for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the, final, the finals are on this Saturday and Sunday. They're in, and it's on TG Cahar as well, is that right? Yeah, yeah. live on TG Cahar. Okay, brilliant stuff. You I mean, just want to get in and do this. Yeah, I know, I want to go and play the match. <laughs> All right. Hey, well, listen, you're, the Michelle, best of luck to both of you. You're sure. from a big basketball family as well, love it too. Yeah, born into it, so ball in the hand as soon as I start walking. Okay. But, like, you don't have to be born into it. Like, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of people who just came across it and are now are really good at it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Some people only pick it up in school and, like, Claire Media, for example, one of the best to ever do it. And Because uh, I was expecting everybody to be about seven foot this morning. <laughs> I mean, they're not. Well, some of, them, some of them are really tall. But, like, is it, is it the advantages when you're really tall like that or does it matter? We no, all have our strong Yeah, seats. that can be an advantage, but, yeah. you know, we're one of the teams in the league who are pretty short, so we're doing pretty well this year for okay. short Okay, did you yeah. have a chance to go professional, uh, but you decided to actually turn it down? Uh, yeah, I decided that growing up it was always something I wanted to do, yeah. and then um, kind of as I got older, 
figured that I love it as a hobby. Mm. Um, like my nine to five on the side and, and just enjoy it because it's a big commitment, you know, yourself looking after your body as a Absolutely. professional athlete. And can you go professional in, in Ireland or would you have to move abroad? No, you can go professional, professional here. here. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. Right. Well, look, at the best to look to both of you at the weekend. Thanks, it's a big sure. weekend the very best in the arena, weekend, right? the basketball the arena. Here. Right, the three, myself and Alan, we're going to do three balls each. Okay, well, three you go. Throw. Three okay. throws. You can get Ready, your first three. Oh, okay. okay. Here we go, right. No! no. <laughs> he was getting them. He was getting them beforehand. Come on, get no. <laughs> Damn it. Okay, if you if Alan Hughes beats me in this, I'm gonna be devastated. <laughs> oh no, you no. to hit the, the hoop. I know, shut up you. Oh please oh, don't go yeah. in. Go on the last one. Please go in. I have to be Tommy Ball. No. Oh, right, okay, okay. So Mern, Mern has in. played basketball. Years ago. But you're over the line. Yeah! Yeah! Oh, that's, that's, that's cheating! That's cheating! Murren! Fair play! Oh, fair play! Oh, fair play. Oh, and in heels! <laughs> and in heels! Oh, no. Uh, yeah, no this. Okay, keep going. Look at it. Uh, nearly there. Okay. Shoot! Oh, I almost cursed. Oh. still there. Oh, this All game. Right. Do uh, you know what? Good. I think Mirren, Mirren won that because she came out first throw <laughs> in, the, in the net. Well, well done, Crazy College Comprehensive guys, basketball guys, team. Loved it. Now yeah, that's all from us today. Right. Coming up tomorrow's show, we are hitting the gym with Olympian David Thank Gillick. Olympian. Fantastic, Edward Hayden is sharing the ultimate brown bread recipe. And actors and best pals Claudia Carroll and <laughs> Kelly Murphy will be dropping by for a chat. We'll see you tomorrow <laughs> at 7. Have a great day. Okay. You should not get that one either. Well, give give Tommy, Tommy, no, Tommy, Tommy some. some. Here we go. Go on, Tommy. No pressure. Here oh, we yeah. go. Go on, you to do it. This weekend. Yeah. Oh! oh, oh the cup there's the cup's gone. The cup's gone. Here we go. Is the pros. Oh! <laughs> 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 Bye. Bye. Oh, sorry. We're still there. Oh, my ear.